Glad to see you all here. We are studying the book of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in June. We're starting, starting in 1st John. Uh, last week is our, was our first message. If you're visiting with us, not too late to go pick up a journal. Uh, we, many of us like to take notes so we can remember later um, some of the truths that we're hearing. But our scripture reading, just a few verses today, 1st John verses 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can be seated. I think we get to listen to that beautiful rain this morning. Uh, welcome. We're studying, uh, as I said, the first epistle or letter of John, the apostle, who uh, probably wrote this to the church in Ephesus. Uh, that's where he was stationed, but also to the house churches in uh, Ephesus and maybe even to all the churches in Asia Minor. Uh, we talked last week about why John was writing this letter. Um, three reasons. He said he wants their joy to be complete. He wants them to avoid wrong or bad theology that will lead them into sin. And he wants them to know that they know Christ. He wants them to have assurance of salvation. Now, in the first four verses last week, he did two things, if you remember. He appealed to his apostolic authority. Uh, So he wants them to know that they need to listen to him because he knows Jesus. That's what he's going to say. He, he knows what Jesus said. He knows what Jesus is like. And he's been given objective truth from above, manifested in the words, deeds, and life of Jesus Christ. So he has firsthand experience with Jesus. He didn't just listen to Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was in communion with Jesus and covenant with Jesus. And it was his way of saying, therefore, listen to what I have to say. It's objectively true because I really know and I really know that I know him. I have truth, I have assurance, I have experience of communion with Christ and I want to give that to you. And then he said, if you can listen to me, if you'll, if you'll listen to me and take what I have to say as truth, then you can have fellowship with me and fellowship with God because those two go together. You can't have fellowship with God and not have fellowship with John or others. You, th- that means that we don't have the same God, John might say. And then we will be in communion together if we have the same God. Koinonia is the word he uses for fellowship. It comes from koinos, which means common. So it means we're sharing in the same thing. It's a common thing that we're experiencing with Christ, with God, and with one another all the same. Okay, so now we're only going to be, that's last week. We're only going to be covering a few verses today because I, This is why I kind of slowed it down here and then next week we'll finish out chapter one because this is an often misunderstood text. And I would say even an abused text in Christian circles. And so I want us not only to get it right, but I want you to know how to get it right uh, because we want to, you know, we want to make self feeders here so that you go and you know how to read the scripture and, and look at other scripture and get it right yourself. When you hear stuff that's not right, you'll know better. But there are three things here that we're going to unpack. I think it was up before, if we can put those up. The three things we're going to be looking at is, first of all, God is light. What does that mean? If we can understand what that means, then we'll be better at understanding what the second concept is. What does it mean to walk in darkness? And then finally, should be really easy by then, what does it mean to walk in the light? Okay? And if we understand those three things, we're going to understand old Grandpa John. And we'll be able to get this right. Okay? So first of all, God is light. John begins with God. He doesn't begin with you. That's important. So when you sit down with Grandpa John, he doesn't start by saying, so how are you doing? What's going on in your life? He begins, and he did this last week, he appeals first to something beyond our feelings, bigger than our own personal journeys. Verse 5, he says, this is the message that we have heard from him. So see, it's not my message, and we proclaim it to you that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. This is a huge theme in the book of John. In fact, it's the central theme, people say, for this letter of John. It's also the central theme, people will say, for his gospel. The gospel message for John can be summed up in three words. God is light. Not God is a light. Not God lights things. God is light. And it's important for us to know what John means by that and therefore what Jesus meant by that. 
And well, again, I'll say what John is saying, first of all, is you have to stop thinking about you for a minute. Get out of yourself. This isn't about you. This is about the universe. This is the huge story of the cosmos. This Genesis 1, it's void. It's darkness. It's meaningless until God shows up on the scene. And the first thing he says is, let there be light. And for John, light equals life. Remember John's gospel. So we can go there because he wrote that gospel. So we'll understand what the author means by light. John, John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 4, he says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, of all men. Verse 9 in chapter 1, he says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He's talking about Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 19, he says, And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. John 8, 12, he remembers Jesus saying, and he wrote it down, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. You see, that's the same thing. But will have the light of life. John 12, 36, while you have the light, Jesus is saying, while I'm here, believe in the light that you may become we should say children of light. So for John, he's been taught firsthand by Jesus and he wants to make it clear in this letter that light equals life. It's everything. It's not just that light gives life, which of course it does, but that by light, as you know, we see everything else, right? So in other words, it's revelation. It's, it's revelation. It gives life. It's life, but it also shows us life. It's everything, or else we're in darkness, plunged into darkness. So the reason why this is, is important, because you might hear some people say, or you might have heard somebody preach this, and they'll say, oh, God is light, that means God is holy, or that means God is sinless, or that means God is perfect, morally perfect. But John's concept of God is light is way too large for those smaller concepts. It's like putting a suitcase on a barred ship and calling it a full load. Of course God is perfect and holy, but that's not his point. God is light. He's everything. He created a world and gave it light, and then he gave it its, his presence. Now, the story of Genesis is mankind rejected God, and the Bible shows us that then the world was plunged into darkness. Later, we'll, we, will, we will learn that it plunged it into the power of the evil one. John here will say later in 1 John 5, 19, and the whole world lives in the power of the evil one. 1 John 5, 19. So do you understand what John is saying? John will later say, oh, it's the prince of darkness. But his point is that the world is plunged in darkness because we've given it over to Satan. And that's John's theology. Now, where did John learn that theology? From Jesus. And, and so what we have learned from scripture is that God needed a new creation because the old creation was plunged into darkness. He needed one to lift the darkness, one to defeat the strong man or the prince of this world. A new, we could say, revelation that they could not have seen or known. They only thought of it, maybe someday. But now the light has come. This is the second creation. Paul will call Jesus the second Adam delivered unto us to do what the first Adam could not do, to walk back the curse by being obedient to God where Adam wasn't. Like Adam, oh my goodness, now I don't want to be too hard on him because I'm sure I would have made the same choice, but the, the dude had the smallest Bible in the world. Like you open it, it says, do not eat from the tree. Right, that's it. You get anything else you can do that you can think of doing, you can do, and you will have relationship with me, and you will remain here in eternal life and in, in the light the whole time, but he doesn't do it. And remember, by the way, because this is important for um, a, mo a modern crowd, God does not say, if you don't obey, I will kill you. God says, if you don't obey, you will surely die. It was out of kindness, God's saying, because to not choose life and light means, by definition, death. So dis disobedience, death, came into the world through humanity, and then we were plunged into darkness. And you could pretty much read the whole Old Testament and say, yep, that's dark, right? Plunged. So what's the plan? 
Jesus Christ had to undo the curse. And John is talking about that. How does Jesus do it? Jesus walks back the curse by obeying the Father perfectly in every way, by being faithful unto death. He remains in relationship with the Father perfectly. And you say, well, then he gets what Adam should have gotten. No. Instead of getting eternal life, Jesus gets hell on the cross. Now, why? Because Jesus deserved eternal life for us. We deserve eternal death. And so the point of the cross is that we can switch places so that through belief in Jesus Christ, John will say, in Christ, we have what Jesus deserved. And Jesus is going to receive on the cross what I deserved, past, present, and future sins of mankind. That's the light. That's the life. It's a revelation of the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a recreation. It's a revelation. It's a way back home. It's a slender little path through the impenetrable mountains of God's justice. Now, what does it take for something to be dark? The answer is nothing, right? The absence of light is darkness. So you have to do something to have light. I remember, I think it was high school, maybe even college. I I was so scared. I want to say it was high school, but I'm sure it was college because we went down into Mammoth Cave and we're passing through and there's a point where they get everybody there and they say, now we're going to turn off the lights so you know how dark it is. And I swear, I lasted three seconds and I started to scream like a girl. Sorry, scream like a person. That was sexist. (laughs) Started to scream. I'm just saying I sounded like a girl. Ah! It's like you couldn't see your hand. And actually, I didn't scream, but I was, I was tense. And I was like, I don't, please turn on the light, please. It's incredibly hard to be in darkness. So God had to create a sun, had to create a moon, right? You don't turn off the dark. You can only turn off the light. You have to do something for light. That's John's appeal here is God did something. The message is God is light. He turns it on so that we... We can know, we can't know anything without the light. We're in darkness, it's our default position. And John's saying, you not only don't know without Jesus, you don't even know what you don't know. We have to have something outside of us to give us light, true light, light that's always light, not light with a little darkness in it, not light with shadows, the light, the light that makes other lights seem dim. That's why in heaven there will be no more sun, no more moon. Because we'll be walking in the light that is the light that dispels all darkness so that everything can be revealed as it really is. It isn't, see, it isn't John's light. It doesn't originate in John's mind or his feelings or the books that he has read. That's how people talk to us today. He's saying, no, I was told and now I know God is light. And so God will therefore furnish from his light the standard and means by which John will be able to later diagnose the error in this church's thinking, to diagnose the error in their experiences and say, no, 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 you don't have God. Not because I'm saying that, because God's light is going to provide John with the means to to propose corrective measures, to, to test what's true or false. So look, John is not like, here's where he's not like your grandpa or grandma, who although they may try to guide you correctly and in love, if they're good grandpas and grandmas, they will at times still get it wrong, and they'll tell you that. Even with the best of intentions, they will sometimes confuse truth with opinion, essentials with non-essentials, their culture with your culture. And so there's oftentimes you can leave the porch swing with your grandpa and you can hold on to some advice, maybe most of the advice, but other things you go, "Uh, I don't, I think that's just grandpa. And you can let some of that go. We don't have the, the, the ability or option of doing that with this grandpa, John. He's saying, listen, The light has been revealed to me. I saw him, I heard him, I touched him. And Jesus testified to the light of life, God the Father, and I realized how wrong I was, how dark I was, how dark of a state that I was in. And I'm willing to tell you about it, to show you the light that was given to me. And so the only way that you're going to be able if you want to leave this porch swing on Sundays and, and say, well, let's, let's sift through that at our lunch and let's hold on to some of the things we heard and, and, and throw away the rest. You can't do that unless, well, two things, two reasons. Maybe because I'm not being, um, I'm not presenting the word as it should be presented, which is possible. 
But the only other way for you to do that is if you don't believe this is God's word. If you actually think that John is not telling the truth that we need to listen to. And so we have to submit to this word and listen to John. So now that we understand that God is light and we understand what that means, that it means life, that it means revelation of the gospel, of salvation, now it gets a little easier to talk about what it means to walk in darkness. John says in verse six, if we say we have fellowship with him, God, but we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice, we do not do the truth. Now, what people or pastors often think this means, I've kind of heard it before, is that darkness is a synonym for evil or sinful behavior, wrong behavior, immorality. It is not. Now, that doesn't mean that darkness is never used to illustrate evil behavior in the Bible. John doesn't use it that way here, and I want to show you. The first text to kind of prove that to you is, again, John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 19. Let's put that up again. And this is the judgment. Now, look at this. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness. Now, if you think that means sinful behavior, people love sinful sinful behavior rather than the light because they were doing sinful behavior. John would be saying the same thing. In other words, to hold to that view means that John is saying people love to sin because they were sinning. Doesn't make sense. What John is saying is people love darkness. You see, they love to stay without revelation because they were sinning. They didn't want to be the truth revealed to them. Darkness is the absence of light. It's the rejection of revelation. It's a denial of the only way to have fellowship with God. Again, it's not God saying to the world, I will kill you. It's God saying to the world, you will surely die. But there's a huge problem here. It's a huge problem in every church. It's a huge problem in my own heart, and John knows it. We don't want to, or maybe we're unable to, if we're not saved, to acknowledge our state of darkness. Right? We don't want to do it. If you ask a fish, Hey, do you really like the water? How's the water? A fish is going to say to you, what is water? Right? Because a fish lives in water. They have never not known water. They would only know what it means to not have water. And so with all humankind, we're born into darkness, into a world of darkness. It's the water we swim in. So what the Bible says as truth is nothing has to happen for a person to be plunged in darkness forever. Something has to happen to a person to come out of darkness and have eternal life. And Jesus Christ did that. He brought light. He testified to the light. God is light. Come to me, all you. Right? And our big problem is we don't even know what we don't know. We don't know what water is. We don't know where we're swimming until a revelation from above, a light shines into the darkness into our world. So walking, of, if somebody says, does walking in darkness lead to sinful, sinful behavior? Of course it does. That's not the point for John, though. Darkness isn't sin or sinful behavior. Darkness is the state by which sin flourishes. It's rejecting or refusing the light of salvation. And John, by the way, he's a dualistic thinker. Um, That means you're going to find through John that he likes to contrast a couple of things all the time and say you're either this or that. It's darkness or light. It's above or below, good or evil, truth and lies, life and death. We're going to hear those things. And he likes to pit those things against one another as opposites. So for those people out there who think that God is light means God is purity or perfection morally, then darkness must mean impurity or immorality, like wrong behavior. But let me tell you something that's not only not true here, but that kind of theology hurts a lot of people's hearts. It's why people sometimes leave church and feel like they've been abused by churches. Because they hear things like, if you walk in sin, meaning if you're struggling with sin, if you have some addictions, if you have some patterns that you haven't overcome, if you're not right yet, then you're a liar and you don't have fellowship with God. Well, hold on a minute. Do you know who struggles with sin? Somebody with the Holy Spirit. 
there's not much of a struggle without the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is the one that makes me feel uncomfortable, makes me feel guilty, makes me feel shame, makes me feel like, what am I doing? Makes me feel like, am I in or out? Now, let me prove it here. And this is probably digging into my next point a little bit. But John says, remember, and let's put that verse up again. He says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, okay, so that we have fellowship with God, that's one thing we have. But now listen to this. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That verse would make no sense if darkness meant sin and light meant pure behavior. Why would I need the sun to cleanse me from all sin if I'm walking in perfect morality? The one walking in darkness is the one who needs to be cleansed from all sin. Right? And so next week, we're going to be talking about just, right, we're not going there now, but verse 8 says, John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You see, the darkness part is deceiving ourselves. If we say we have no sin, then we're walking in darkness. To say you have sin means that you are a what? Sinner. And you're walking in the light. If we walk in the light, Christ keeps on cleansing us from sin. You know that word that, that, we, that he will cleanse us from? That's a present tense word. In the Greek, it means continually, habitually performed. So if we walk in the light, what is going to happen? Christ keeps cleansing us from sin because we will keep on sinning and the light of Christ will keep showing more sin to us, revealing more in us that we need to change and we will keep confessing that sin and keep repenting. The person who says, no, I'm done with sin, I'm a saint, I don't want they're walking in darkness. Walking in darkness is a refusal or a denial to listen, see, touch light, to listen, see, touch the light. It's saying we have no sin. It's saying we don't swim in water. Let's just forget it. It's self-deception. Darkness is death, which is opposite of revelation. It's the opposite of life. So the one who walks in darkness is one who has rejected the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, the eternal life. And so if you want to rephrase verse 7, you would rephrase it this way. If we say that we have communion with God, fellowship with God, while at the same time rejecting the gospel which comes through repentance and forgiveness as the only way to enter into communion with God, then we're lying and we do not know the truth. You can't say you have communion with God and not go through the process of repentance continually. But now to our last point, which should be very easy now, because if we understand those two concepts, light, then we can apply it here. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So again, now I think it's easy to understand. Walking in the light does not mean being morally pure. It means having purity imputed to you through confession and repentance of sin and the acceptance of Jesus Christ. It means you're pure through Christ. God's revelation of himself through Jesus, the new creation, so that we can receive eternal life and be forgiven our sins. That's why John can say, this is the entire message, he says. God is light, right? The, the only way to say the entire message is not to say because God is sinless. God is the light. And so walk in the light. Again, it would make no sense if John is saying, God, the whole message is God is sinless or perfect, so therefore walk in sinless perfection. No, John is saying, walk in revelation. The world is plunged in darkness. We're all fish in water. We, di we didn't even know what water was until Jesus came, and I'm sorry to strain the illustration, but Jesus came as a fish, right? Into our place, into our world, and taught us where we were and how to get out. Showed us, saved us. Walk in God's revelation of eternal life, which includes the means of removing sin, the thing that separates us from God, and that's it, walk in the gospel. If I could say anything about what it means to walk in the life, it means walk in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross will keep doing its work in our lives. We go to the cross, we go to the cross, and what do we see there? Yes, we see I'm incredibly bad because look, he's dying for me still. But I'm also incredibly loved because how valuable must I be that he would pay such a high price to bring me home? Now, I want to say something here that can kind of help us. Uh, I think I'm kind of uh, 
feeding you a little bit for next week so we can understand next week's text about confession and sin. There's different ways that God saves us, and we usually, only, we usually mesh them all together, and that's why we get confused. When Christ died for us, we were immediately saved from the penalty of sin. Amen? That means, the, the big the, it's not even that big, but the, the theological word is justification. It means we're cleansed and sealed for eternity. It's done. It's finished. We're, we're as if we're standing at the right hand of God with our advocate, Jesus Christ. But that's not the whole thing that salvation does. That's the immediate salvation called justification. But we're also being saved from the power of sin. And that's what John is talking about. The continual work of the Holy Spirit revealing our sin. By the way, the Holy Spirit reveals your sin, not the person next to you. Reveals our sin, convicts us of our sin, and we repent of sin. And the Holy Spirit reveals more sin and we repent of sin. And that's called, do you know the word? sanctification that's the work that we do that Paul says that we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling that's walking in the light now there's one more we're not going to talk about it right now but the last one is called glorification which is that someday we will be saved from the presence of sin does that make sense so someday there will not be sin anyway it's all thrown into the darkness into the fiery you know embers of hell and gone forever so that we don't even have to struggle with sin but anyways martin luther had a great way of putting the two together sanctification and justification in a way that i understand and maybe it will uh, you too it starts with a it's a latin phrase but he would say this simul justus et peccator simul is latin for simultaneously or at the same time so at the same time justus you kind of know what that means it means just or righteous and pe- and et peccator means sinner. So the Christian understands that we're at the same time justified and sinner. We're just and righteous before God because the righteousness of God is imputed to me forensically, legally. I'm already saved. My name's in the book of life. But at the same time, in actuality, I'm here sinning, still a sinner. That's why Johnson, if we have no sin... See, if we don't admit we're, we're still sinners, we're still struggling with sin here. We're still fighting the old nature. I've never met somebody who said, I, you know, I don't believe that I need to repent because I'm not a sinner anymore. And I just want to say, can I talk to you a little bit about, I, I know some, like, can I share with you? <laughs> like, what do you mean? We're still battling our inward leanings towards paths of death. That's why the great you know, hymn writer said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. You know, a Christian had to write that with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you just leave, you just wander. You're not struggling with it. So, so, so do we know what this means now, right? From John, do we, can, we, can we teach that text to others so that it's not so abusive and, and people can understand it? We're going to talk about confession uh, next week. Um, and we'll spend the whole time on maybe the differing views and why people lean one way or the other. But <clears throat> let me, the last thing I want to talk about is kind of like hidden there, but I want you to see it. Notice what John says in this verse, and I want to put it up there again. He says, if you say you have fellowship with God, but walk in darkness, we lie. And then he says the other thing, which should be the opposite. He says, but if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, have you caught the weirdness there? What John should have said is if we walk in the light, if we, walk, if we say we have fellowship with God but walk in darkness, we lie. But if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with God. Now, why, why does he switch it out? Why does he switch out fellowship with God suddenly with fellowship with one another? It's almost as if John believes that he can use those interchangeably. It's almost as if John believes they're the same thing. And I'm here to tell you this morning, they are. Fellowship with God for John means fellowship with his children. And fellowship with his children means fellowship with God. John might say to you, haven't you been listening? Listen, haven't you read my gospel? Chapter 17, Jesus Christ before he died, what did he say? Read it. That's what John's saying. That's, that's all he's you know, bringing out here. It's like Jesus is praying before he dies and he says, Father, I've been one with you. You're one with me. We're together and they are with me 
and therefore we're all one together. And I pray that someday all will come to know me so that we can all be one. So fellowship with God was fellowship with the apostles and the apostles fellowship with Jesus meant fellowship with God, all the same thing. Last week, John talked about uh, fellowship with us, he said, as our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. So he sees them as all one thing. One God, therefore, fellowship with one another is also fellowship with God. And I, don't, I just want to say, I don't think, maybe for you, but certainly for me, that I have seriously considered the implications of this. The most popular phrase in the New Testament for the church used over a hundred times is the phrase, one another. Confess to one another. Be at peace with one another. Forgive one another. Serve one another. Be kind to one another. Submit to one another. Teach one another. Exhort one another. Pray for one another. And do you know why the Bible does that? Because the main artery... The, the main highway to experiencing God, oneness with God, is through the children of God. One anothering one another. Does that make sense? That's why people will sometimes leave God. Because of the experience that they're lacking in the body of Christ. They've never experienced God correctly. Let me give you one example. There could be so many. Let's say I have sinned. I mean... It's completely, <laughs> obviously I do. So, but it's not big enough that you all hear about it. But uh, it's a sin where I really hurt somebody's heart. A friend of mine or maybe a family member and I did it purposefully and I just was in a bad mood and I didn't care and I really hurt their heart. And what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do is sometime later, it could be a day or a week, I'm gonna feel bad about that. And... What I'm going to do first is I'm going to go to God and I've said, God, I know that was bad. And will you forgive me? And I just want you to know that I guarantee that, God, that God's going to forgive me. It's promised to me. But that's not all I need. Do you know when I'm actually going to feel the forgiveness of God? When that brother or sister hugs me and says, oh, I do forgive you, Don. And then someone with the Holy Spirit will be communicating to, to me an experience with God's forgiveness. And I will probably break down and for the first time I'll feel the forgiveness of my Lord. Now you know why not forgiving a brother or sister, which happens in the church and I don't think it should ever happen in the church, is such a big deal for God. In fact, such a big deal for God that he says he won't forgive you if you don't forgive others. Why do you think that is? Because when you say to others, you know what, God may forgive you, but I don't forgive you, you can't say that. When you say, I don't forgive you, it's like saying God doesn't forgive you. You're hoarding God's forgiveness. He gives it to you so that you will give it to others. You're you're damaging his reputation. You're harming his gospel. It's supposed to pass through to you, to others. There's parables about that. How dare you hold back the experience of God's forgiveness for others because you don't want to. So we one another, one another, because that's how we're going to experience God. The best way, the easiest way. Now, of course, if we, if we can't get that, God will open up other little arteries. And we might be able to find him through a book or art or, or reading or in the woods or, or something, some other way. But the main way is through brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can get way more of an experience with God in one anothering than you can going to a mountain alone in a cabin. Like... How do, you, how do you understand or experience or believe that you can be patient alone? You're not going to be patient until like, you get married or, or like get, get a dog first. That's better. And then, and they're, they're not alike. But you get a dog and you're like getting a spouse and then you have kids and then you have coworkers and you have a boss and you have employees and you have teachers and you have coaches and then you'll understand what patience is, what it means. 
How, how are you going to know peace with one another? I'm perfectly at peace with myself up on a mountain alone. Now throw me into a group of believers. How will, let me ask us something that's really dear to me. How am I going to know that I'm loved by God if you don't love me? You, you know what the fruit of the Spirit is, right? It's God's way of saying, listen, I'm going to give you myself, right? Because it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He came after Jesus. Jesus said, one greater than I is going to come. Here comes God in a different form. And the Holy Spirit gives us what, it's called the communicable gifts of God, right? It's called the fruit of the Spirit. We don't get the non-communicable gifts of God. That would be like... Um, the Holy Spirit doesn't make us omniscient or omnipresent or omnipotent. Like we're not all powerful. We don't like none of that. That stays with God. But we get the communicable gifts of God that come to us through having God in us. That's how it happens. They develop in us. You know what those are? Let me read those. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. You're going to have a hard time convincing me that those are for you, for you. Like, you think Jesus died for you so you could be kind to yourself? I mean, that's some Oprah stuff right there. <laughs> he died for you, and with the Holy Spirit, now you can be a part of others experiencing God's kindness. God's patience, God's joy, God's love for you. That's why you have the Holy Spirit, for you, for others. That's why John later will say things like, and we'll get to it, if you don't love others, you don't love God. What? See, now we understand what he's talking about. They're the same thing for John. So let's practice as a church as best we can with our Holy Spirit to one another, one another, because I guarantee there's somebody sitting next to you right now today who needs one of those gifts in their life. Don't withhold it. Every time I've had somebody come up to me and say, praying for you, I experience a little bit more of God's care for me. So let's one another, one another. Let me pray. Dear Father, as we listen to the rain, it makes us think of your blessings in our life. It makes us think of your mercy and grace that we're supposed to remember when it rains and we don't die like those caught in Noah's day, but that we have a lifeboat that we can get on called Jesus Christ and we can handle all the waters that come our way. I pray that your Holy Spirit will rain down upon us. That we will be full of the Holy Spirit. That the, the fruit of the Spirit will grow in us. and We will learn how to share that with others. That we become trees of life that others in our midst can come and eat and say, it's good. It's good to be together. It's good to covenant together. This is how I know more of God than I ever could have known because of my brothers and sisters who are practicing and growing in the fruit of the Spirit. Father, thank you for John, the one beloved by you as we all are, and that he's willing to kind of sit with us and talk to us about these very important things. We love you. We love your word given to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.